Hello, you two. Welcome back to day three of Sports Miss. I am your host, Kyle Alexander, back here on KLA Sports, and we're keeping up with the trend. So, of uh, uploading every day until Christmas. So, we're here with five things that we learned from week 13 of the NFL uh, season. And, uh, yeah, let, that's it. So, let's hop right into it. So, the first thing that we learned is Lamar and the Ravens are legit contenders. And they have an elite O-line. Now, Ravens, they defeated the San Francisco 49ers 20-17. to They also had the number one defense. And that win adds on to the Ravens' win streak as they have won eight straight, including the Seattle Seahawks, New England Patriots, Houston Texans, and the San Francisco 49ers. Now, beating those teams, the Ravens, excuse me, the Ravens proved that they can pretty much go out there and beat anybody. Now, you're probably thinking, Kyle, the Ravens, just, Ravens lost to the Chiefs and the Browns. Right, okay, I don't have to keep bringing up the Browns' loss. We get it. We know they lost, but not only that, this is nowhere near the, near the same defense that the Ravens had at that time. This defense has been upgraded. They got two linebackers who can tackle and is okay in occasion coverage, and LJ Fort and Josh Bynes. And they also got a, another corner in Marcus Peters, who's been an interception machine and is actually tied for the interception lead. He's like uh, him and somebody else are tied for fifth. Uh, are mean, tied for first with five interceptions. So, yeah, that's what this says to me. The Ravens can pretty much go out there and beat anyone. Their run game is unstoppable. Lamar is unstoppable. He's doing a good job being this team. But another, uh, let's talk about an underrated unit, unit in, like in general in football, but nobody talks about for the Ravens. That's the O-line. Ravens have an elite O-line. Uh, and hear me out here. Last in the last two weeks, they've played Aaron Donald and Nick Bosa. Nick Bosa, Aaron Don. Well, let's talk about Aaron Donald. Aaron Donald uh, is a multiple win. He's uh, he's won Defensive Player of the Year two times, and he's the reigning Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, last year, broke the record for the set most sacks by a defensive tackle. Uh, what a mm, yeah! Aaron Donald's a beast. Voted he was voted the number one player in uh the NFL last year. Then you got Nick Bosa, who's the consensus unanimous defensive rookie of the year. He has eight total sacks in the year for a rookie. That's pretty impressive. The Ravens held both of them, Aaron Donald and Nick Bosa, combined to a total of two tackles. Each of them had one. So they held Aaron Donald to a tackle and they held Nick Bosa to a tackle. That's impressive. That's that's already impressive right there. They they completely made Aaron Donald and Nick Bosa non factors. Then they're also they're the key to the run game. If you notice they they've been blocking, they've been doing their thing up front, doing the dirty work. And they've opened up some holes for the running backs. Like just enough, like just enough. Not even just enough. They open up good holes for the running backs and Lamar to get through. They keep pushing forward when Lamar does a keeper, like on goal line situations or on like fourth and one. And they're the key to they're the key to this offense. Without them, the it doesn't get done. And also, Ravens have now taken the first seed after Houston beat New England. But the Ravens have taken the first seed, and honestly, they could win out and can remain the first seed. And if the playoffs run through Baltimore, it's going to be trouble for the AFC. All right, that's the first thing we learned. Second thing we learned is the Tennessee Titans are a threat. Yes, you heard you heard it here first. Uh, let's just start with some simple stuff. They benched Marcus Mariota when they played Denver. Since then, the team is five and one with Ryan Tannehill starting, which brings the record to a uh, total of seven and five. The team just plays better with him. Ryan Tannehill is doing this thing; he's throwing darts out there, like some of the like that touchdown pass he had, that long touchdown pass he had against uh, Indianapolis this week. That was a that was a nice pass. He's and the thing is, he's like cool. Calm, he's just cool and calm about it. I know he's a veteran, but. He's just he's honestly just doing his thing. He's like he's like, okay, my time with ten but Miami didn't work out and they let me go or they traded me and now I'm getting another opportunity here with uh them benching Marcus Mariota. 
So this is my time. This is Tana. This looks like Tana Hill's breakout year. And I just saw this online too when I was doing some research for this video. They said, uh, I saw, I came across an article that said K Tana Hill is a serious consideration for comeback player of the year. And as you saw in my other video, I had Dalvin Cook winning, but honestly, it's the truth. He could win comeback player of the year with the way he's playing. Uh, Tana Hill, his season stats this year, 1,179 yards, seven touchdowns, two interceptions, five straight games without an interception. Both of those interceptions came in his first start. So, or, yeah. So, Tannehill has just been going off. Like, he's finally breaking out. He's finally breaking out into that potential that we saw him be. And, honestly, if I'm the Titans, I will wait on, get a, on getting a quarterback. I will let Marcus Mariota walk because this is his contract year, I believe. I would, um, whatchamacallit. Have Ryan Tannehill be QB for one more year. Maybe in this draft, get an old lineman or another receiver or somebody on defense. You know, just just don't get a quarterback in the don't 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 use your first round pick or your early draft picks on a quarterback. And plus, next year they had you got Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, all those quarterbacks. Um. Also, they, Tennessee has a chance to get the sixth seed. They're currently tied with the Steelers, but the Steelers have the sixth seed as of now. But they just need them to lose one game. They just have to win, and they can get that. They'll have that sixth seed. So just know if Tennessee makes the playoffs, it won't be no cakewalk. Okay, so the third thing, moving on, moving on pretty quick here. But the third thing we learned from this week is that the Philadelphia Eagles are done and should tank. Pains me to say this as an Eagles fan, but they stink. They suck. They lost thirty-seven to th <clears throat> excuse me. They lost thirty-seven to thirty-one to the Dolphins, the Miami Dolphins, the team that's supposed to be tanking. Um, offensive coordinator Mike Grow wasn't great. His the play calling was bad that game, and also I'm looking. They ran the ball nine nineteen times. When Miami has the thirty first ranked rush Russian defense, and you if Miami, Miami has the second the worst run defense in the league, and you have you have the running backs that you have jo Jordan Howard, Jay Ajayi, uh, Miles Sanders, and you only run the ball nineteen times. It's something wrong with you. I'm sorry. There's something wrong with you. Run the ball more. And that's what, that's, that is what uh, Philly has been thriving off lately. Like, when they played the Bills, they won that game because of, the, because of the ground attack. In these last couple games, they even though they lost to the Seahawks and, uh, and the Patriots, they've been in it because of the run game, the defense and the run game. Defense looked bad, too. Defense was, oh, my gosh. But at this point, the... That's what I. If I'm the Eagles, I want them to lose out the rest of the year. I want them to tank at this to tank the rest of the year. Because even if they, even if they can somehow win the division, they're gonna be first round exits. I I hate to say it, but they've lost to they've lost to every team that's currently in the NF, AF, NFC playoff picture except the Green Bay Packers and the Saints. They haven't played the Saints, but they beat the Packers. But they don't have the same team. So, if I'm the Eagles, I would just tank the rest of the year, draft a receiver or a receiver in a corner. I would draft a receiver first, then get a corner in the second round. Let Nelson Aguilar walk because he's been terrible. Maybe I know Eagles fans are going to be mad, but um, I actually saw this from C4, the Madden YouTuber who's an Eagles fan. He was saying, look at the trademark for Zach Ertz, and honestly, not a bad idea. They were talking about trading him for Jalen uh Jalen Ramsey earlier in the year. Maybe do that because they got Dallas Goddard. Goddard can take over and be that franchise tight end. But, um, yeah, I'll just definitely look at some new stuff. And also, find new coordinators. Because was uh, Mike Grow and Jim Schwartz just ha haven't really been that great this year. And we need to look at some out, like, look at some people outside instead of keeping everything in the house. So, yeah, that's what I have to say on the Eagles. I want them to tank and get a receiver. Like, get. Get Henry Ruggs to be the deep threat. 
or a CD Lamb as a jumbo. No, get Henry Ruggs to be the deep threat. And then in the second round, if he's there, take CJ Henderson. If not, maybe Bryce Hall from Virginia. But yeah, that's what I would do if I'm the Eagles. All right, moving on pretty quickly here. The fourth thing that we learned this week is Nick Foles is overpaid and Gardner Minshew should start. My gosh, Nick Foles. Won the Eagles the Super Bowl. Almost took them back to the championship game. And teams are looking at him to be a QB. To be a QB. Now, when I first... Uh, when I first heard reports of him signing in Jacksonville, or when it was pretty much confirmed that he was going there without before he signed there, I'm like, okay, they're going to sign for like maybe a year or two, or he's going to sign a not a huge contract, but he's he's going to sign like a a pretty decent contract, and then he's going to be a start for like a year or two, man. Maybe Jacksonville draft a QB in this draft, signed him eighty eight million. You know what he's done? Broke his collarbone week one. I'm not blaming that on him, but broke his collarbone week one. And now he's 0-4 in games that he started. I may not be a math genius, but but 80, $88 million does not equal a 0-4 production. And I'm not blaming the injury on, this, on him, like because you can't really blame injuries on people. But the best... Listen, I forgot how the saying went. It was like... But basically... The best, the best ability is availability. I think that's what it was. But basically, the best asset an athlete can have is availability. And he's been out for the whole year, and played and started in four games. He's zero and four in game in all those games. Jags lost three straight. And Garner Mishnu, I actually saw this while I was researching. They said Garner Mishnu will start for the rest of the season. Foles is going to the bench. Uh, Foles is, he hasn't really been that great this year. And honestly, if I'm Jacksonville, I would move on from him. Maybe keep him to be like a mentor for Mesh New. But what do you, the thing is, what do you do with him now? Because now, now you sign him to this $88 million contract. You traded Jalen Ramsey away. So now, and now you don't have, a, you don't have a lot of cap space. And now Foles is getting $88 million. Uh, you got to pay Yannick and Gakwe unless y'all you're gonna let him walk. Then who you gonna have? I mean, maybe Taven Bryant, but Calais Campbell's getting paid, I believe. Marcel Darius was get, is getting paid a good amount too. It's just horrendous. So they're just horrendous at contracts. So yeah, if I'm them, yeah, cause just starting for the rest of the year, cause Garner Mishnu is the franchise QB. And if you start him for the rest of the year, you give him some experience. So that way, heading into his sophomore year, he's like, all right, this is the stuff I need to work on. Um, also, like some of the like the division games, he's like, all right, these are my division rivals. This is their weakness. Or right, this is what I, uh, what helped us that game. Or this is what had, like, I'm, I'm trying to worry, but um, this is their weakness. This is what they're bad at. So how can I take advantage of that? You know, he can learn and grow as an NFL QB. And like I said, have Foles to be his mentor. But yeah, that was a bad contract signing. He's looking like he's being overpaid. All right, the last and final thing that we learned from week 13. Wow, this seems like a quick video. But uh, the last and final thing we learned is Drew Locke is Denver's franchise QB. Now, some of you are probably looking and saying, Kyle, no, he's not. Um, I even saw people saying Denver should draft a QB this year or had them drafting the QB in the mock draft. But honestly, when I heard that stuff, and not even that, when I heard um, what was it, like Brandon Allen was starting when Flacco first went down when they played the Browns, I'm like, well, where is Drew Locke? Why isn't he playing? Because honestly, I've been high on Drew Locke since he, since he entered the draft. Because I'm like, he to me, he had the best arm in that uh, class. He was the most accurate QB. Had, he has a cannon. And he can. Uh, the only thing that messed him up, messed his stats up, was that his receivers dropped a lot of passes in college. But I felt he had a lot of upside. Give him the right weapons. Uh, first of all, he won his first NFL start, beating the Chargers twenty-three to twenty in a crazy game. In case you guys haven't seen that, it was crazy. I saw the last. Like, I saw the last couple seconds. So the Chargers scored to tie it up at twenty. Then they do a 
kick to keep it. They kick the ball to keep it uh, from being a touchback. The guy takes it back a little bit. And what's the name? The commentator was saying, all right, they're probably just going to nail it, take it overtime. But they saw Drew Locke looking at his play sheet thing on his wrist. And he, and the commentator was like, well, it doesn't look like um he's not looking at the thing like it says nail on there. So they basically, they just call a pass, like a deep bomb, try it, see if they can get in field goal range or get a touchdown or a miracle or something. And honestly, I was like, that's smart. Chargers sent three people rushing. Drew Locke bombs it deep to Cortland Sutton. And then it was incomplete. But then there was a flag. They called Casey Hayward for a pass interference. And I was like, oh. I was, and then even the commentator said that was the plan the whole time. Draw the pass interference. Move them in the... And it's from the... It's 15 yards from the spot of the foul. So it puts them in well in the field goal range. Or not well, but that puts them in field goal range. Drew Locke was happy. Uh, and then Brandon McManus hit the game with a field goal to win 23-20. to So that's some good IQ from the coaching and the Broncos. Um, also, Locke in that game. Before the game, I predicted Locke would have 250 to 270 passing yards, three touchdowns, and one interception. He had 134 yards, two touchdowns, and an interception, and a QB rating of 84.5. Not the exact same, but I was only off by one touchdown, and I got the interception right. But um, so some of the stuff I saw in there was Locke looked ready. He looked he looked like he could be an he looked like he was ready to be the Broncos franchise QB. Like he was ready to be the NFL quarterback. Uh, Locke and Sutton clicked on the field. That first touchdown he had, it was a bomb. It was a good touchdown. It was a nice touchdown pass right on the money. And Sutton being athletic, he just made the play. Um, Locke has an arm. Like I said earlier, he has an arm. He had to me, he had the best arm in that draft class last year. Uh, in this cl draft class, um, he was accurate. He to me, he was the most accurate QB in the draft class, and he he was accurate with most of his throws. Like I said, that first touchdown, that first touchdown that he threw. Um, he saw Der Derwin James. You all know he. Everybody knows Derwin James. He's a safety. He can play in the box, whatever. So knowing this. Like, you know this coming into the game. Derwin, you see Derwin James lined up on the line or in the box. You see him, and then you see, so you see him, so you're like, all right, he's probably going to blitz. He blitz, he hikes the ball. Derwin James blitzes. So Locke's like, okay, I see this, I recognize it. He sees Cortland Sutton one-on-one -on -one with this man, with the corner. Throws it up for, throws it out, up and out for Sutton to go out and grab it. Sutton had a step on his receiver, so he threw it out. Sutton had one arm pin, but he went out and grabbed it with one hand for a touchdown. That was a good play. Good play by the QB. Great recognition by the QB. Great throw. It was out there. Put some air on it for Sutton to go up and get it. And also, he looked. Po he just looked poised, and he led his team to led his team out there. So to me, Drew. Like I've already, I've been high on Drew Lock. I've seen the potential. I've seen potential in him. So if I'm Denver, if I'm John Elway, I'm like, okay. Drew Lock is Drew Lock, or if you look at the look at how he plays out the rest of the season, but if he plays well, you say well after the first game you're already saying all right he may be our franchise QB. I know it's one game, but he may be the franchise QB. Maybe like this is the reason we like that's why we drafted him, give him a gave giving him a chance. So maybe see how he plays the rest of the season. If he plays good, Denver win a couple games, and they're like okay, Drew Lock is the answer. We're gonna build around him. And honestly, Denver has a pretty talented roster. Phillip Lindsay's a nice running back. Cortland Sutton's a good receiver. They got Noah Fant. Um, who the Deshaun Hamilton's a, he's a pretty good receiver. I feel he's serviceable. Uh, and then the defense with Von Miller, Chris Harris. Uh, I was about to say Nick Chubb. Uh, what's it? Bradley Chubb and uh, the defense is. I have a pretty good defense. I mean, they can improve on some stuff, but nice pass rush. And then, if I'm Denver, I would draft draft some O line, and then get another another outside receiver. Put Hamilton in the slot. There's your offense. All right, so that is it for this episode for day three of Sports Miss. Um, and I know this is this video is going to be uploaded late. But I have, I am in school and I have homework and stuff and I have exams coming up. So, so the videos these next two weeks are going to get uploaded probably around this time. But yeah, I'm still going to try and keep it up and upload, record and upload every day. 
So uh, yeah, that's like I said that's it for sport for day three of sports miss. Tune back in tomorrow for day four. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will talk to you guys later.